Thank you for joining me today from wherever you may be. My name is Kirsten Moffitt, and I am so honored to be a part of the first Pigments Revealed Symposium. Pigments are my passion, and while I'm sorry that we can't be together in person, it is a thrill to contribute to this event that explores and celebrates the power of natural pigments with others who feel the same way. And I especially want to thank Melanie for organizing this symposium and putting in so much work to make it happen. I work for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation in Virginia. We are an educational nonprofit institution, which is the largest open air living history museum in the United States. We are located in the restored town of Williamsburg, which was the 18th century capital of the Virginia colony and we strive to tell the nation's origin story and the complex stories of the people who've lived and worked here through our museums, historical trades, interpretation, and programming. I would like to begin by formally acknowledging the indigenous peoples as historical custodians of the land at Williamsburg. Colonial Williamsburg acknowledges the indigenous peoples who are the original inhabitants of the lands our foundation is on today. The Terran Haka, not away. Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Mattapanai, Monacan, Nansmund, not away, Pamunkey, Padawomac, Upper Mattapanai, and Rappahannock tribes and pay our respect to their tribal members, past and present. On a personal note, I recognize that this land acknowledgement is just one very small step towards addressing the impacts of colonialism to indigenous communities. Like many others, this has been a time of deep personal reflection for me, and I'm thankful for this chance to learn and grow. I acknowledge that while my institution and its collection has traditionally focused on the colonial story, that story is problematic for many. I am proud to say that we are working hard to tell a more inclusive story, including amplifying the voices of American Indians in the Chesapeake Bay region and how they have been and continue to be an integral part of the American story. And I've included here on this slide, for those who are interested, links where you could learn more about the native peoples of the Chesapeake region and how we share the American Indian experience at Colonial Williamsburg. So I am trained as an art conservator. So I view pigments through the lens of the technical art history of art and artifacts. I am not trained as a soil scientist or a geologist, and so I look forward to learning more about natural pigments from this perspective from the various talks included in this unique symposium. And that's, of course, what's so fantastic about events like this, because it gives us this great platform to learn from one another and to do better work, because we all want to do better work. So this is our materials analysis laboratory where I carry out our work. It's located within the conservation department of the institution which is responsible for the care and preservation of our collection. The lab houses a suite of sophisticated analytical instruments, all of which are donor funded, as we are again a nonprofit institution. And as the foundation's materials analyst, it is my responsibility to undertake analytical research for the foundation's curators and conservators, as well as for the Department of Architecture, Preservation, and Research. So just a quick review, we have a handheld XRF for elemental analysis, an FTIR for the analysis of organics like paint binding media, and we also have a scanning electron microscope with elemental analysis capabilities. But our high-powered optical microscope is, to me, my most important and favorite tool, particularly for the analysis of paints and pigments. And that's the instrument that I'm using in the image on the left here. So I, I not only analyze paints and pigments, but all collection materials, including glass, silver, ceramics, textiles, works on paper, furniture, etc. cetera. 
But of course, today I'm going to focus on my work with architectural coatings, particularly the use of natural pigments and other materials in our historic house paints. And this is because architectural paint research is actually my specialty and my favorite research topic. So here at our institution, we have 400 buildings in our historic area, 88 of which are original. So these buildings have proved to be a rich resource to learn more about how natural materials such as red and yellow ochres, chalks, lime washes, and tars were used to preserve and decorate buildings of the past. Pigments are an integral part of our material culture and my work to analyze and identify them helps me and my colleagues better understand how an object might have looked originally, um, how it has changed over time, and how we can best preserve it for future generations. So I know that this might be a bit of a departure from some of the other lectures, but I hope that it's going to give you some insight into paint analysis and provide you with a new perspective on how one can look at paints and pigments under the microscope and with these various other scientific techniques. So of course, most historic buildings have been painted and repainted many, many times over the years, completely obscuring the earliest paint layers. So to get to those earliest coatings, we need to collect carefully chosen samples and that those that allow us to kind of excavate to the most, through the most recent layers of paint. So the most important method that I use to study historic paints is through this technique called cross-section microscopy. So to conduct this technique, samples are collected on site with a surgical scalpel, and they ideally contain a portion of the substrate, usually wood, with all of the paint layers attached. And then back in the lab, these paint chips are mounted in a small cube of polyester resin. And once that resin cures, the cube is ground down until the edge of the paint chip is exposed and the surface is then polished um, to a mirror smooth finished and examined with our high powered microscope. And in my lab, I use a Nikon NIU microscope. So in this image um, on the left here, we see a small Ziploc baggie with some of those paint chips. Um, they're, the samples that I need are typically just a few millimeters across. And, and here you see a resin cube with a paint chip uh, fixed inside. And this, this particular paint sample has been polished to a high finish and is ready for microscopy. So my NIU microscope uses reflected visible and ultraviolet light to examine samples. It can go up to 1,000 times magnification, and it's equipped with a digital camera and software for capturing all of these images that you'll see today. So I can learn so much just by looking at these samples. And so this here is one of my favorite examples of um, a mounted paint chip and some of the things that it can tell us. So this was collected from one of our 18th century buildings called the Robert Carter House. And so it does contain a little bit of that wood substrate here in the bottom. When the wood is cross-sectioned, you can see a lot of the, the wood cells. And we have the earliest paint layer applied to that wood. And we have all of the paint layers that have been applied through time. And one of the initial things that one might notice is that these paints here are all of the early hand ground paints. Um, how do I know they're hand ground? Well, it's because they're, they're quite coarse. Um, see, these have been, been mulled and ground into oil by hand. So the pigment particles are very uneven. Some of them are large, some of them are, are finer. But these up here are our modern industrially prepared paints. So you see how smooth and fine um, these particular paints are. These have been made in a factory. Um, and another interesting piece of evidence um, in this sample is the way that these, the natural stratigraphy of these early paints is kind of abruptly cut off here. And that's um, something that we typically see when paints have flaked and then been scraped down over time. And then these modern paints have been applied um, over that. So this, this technique um, can tell me a lot about the number and the nature of layers. So it's a lot more than just telling me 
um, what the very first paint color was. So there's, there's that's just the tip of the iceberg of the information that I can gather from a paint cross section. And so instead of paint analysis, some of my colleagues actually use the term paint archaeology. And many of us, including me, use the term stratigraphy, meaning the layered structure of, of, of the paint layers. So it strikes me that this term is also used by archaeologists and I am sure the soil scientists here in the audience. And in many ways, when I look at these paint cross sections, I love to see how the layers interact with each other. And depending on the age and the deterioration of the paints, they can sometimes be very deeply cracked and flow into and around one another. So you do have to have an understanding of this behavior of these layers when looking at these samples. So everything isn't always perfectly level and smooth. If it was, my, my job would be much easier. But it does, that disruption does make these samples, in my mind, uh, very beautiful and compelling. And I'm showing you here two paint cross sections taken from the Thomas Everard house um, that kind of show some of that deterioration and, and disruption. Um, and in addition, I'm showing a visible light image as well as a UV light image. And um, the main reason why I'm doing that here is you can see um, some of these paint layers have this kind of bluish bluish green twinkling autofluorescence, and that's quite indicative of uh, zinc-based pigments, which don't come into use in house paints until the mid-19th century. So for me in my work, that's a, using ultraviolet light and being able to identify materials like zinc white pigment, uh, it's extremely helpful. Polarizing light microscopy, or PLM, is another technique I use to identify pigment particles based on their optical and morphological properties in transmitted plane and cross-polarized light. So to do this, I collect a few grains of the pigment on the tip of a scalpel or a very fine tungsten needle, and I disperse them onto a glass slide. These samples are extremely small, and often I can't even see them with my naked eye when I'm preparing them. And then polarized light is transmitted through the particles, and they kind of respond almost like shards of stained glass as the light passes through them. It helps me better see their uh, optical and physical properties, um, like their, their color, or their size, their shape, their degree of crystallinity. And of course, unless they're opaque, like many of these carbon-based blacks are. So this technique is particularly helpful to me because I just learned so much from just looking at the components of a paint sample. Because the, usually paints are heterogeneous. They have lots of different components. Just one brown paint can contain re both red and yellow iron oxides, red lead, white lead, carbon black, chalk fillers, and all of these things can be missed if I only went straight to an analytical instrument. Um, so to get confident identifications for um, certain pigments, I can analyze them with our scanning electron microscope, or SEM. So our SEM can achieve very high magnifications, uh, above 1,000 time, 100,000 times, although I never really have to go that high for pigments. And it's coupled with an energy dispersive spectrometer, or EDS, which gives me elemental data at any point that I target in the sample. So here, for instance, is a sample of some red iron oxide pigment that I uh, got from Fallon, Sweden. Um, there it is known as Fallon Red, collected from an area rich in ochres, known as the Copper Mountain. And in the spectrum here, you see major peaks for iron and oxygen from those iron oxide minerals. And often when I analyze naturally sourced ochres, I see a lot of other elements like calcium, silicon, and aluminum from the other minerals that are associated with that source. So scientific analysis is just one way that we've learned about natural pigments in historic house paints. Documentary sources are also extremely helpful. So thanks to advertisements like these from the Virginia Journal, we know which paint materials were regularly imported to the colonies and advertised for sale. And time and time again, we see the same paint materials listed. White and red lead, blue and green vertiter, chalk, umbers, ochres, verdigris, Prussian blue, 
indigo, ivory black, lamp black. And paint media like linseed oil, dryers, turpentine, and varnishes are also mentioned. So this gives us a good basis for what was available at the time. Some pigments were offered in a dry powder form, others were already ground in oil. And so here in this particular advertisement, you can see that the Spanish brown, which um, would have been a term, and, and the Venetian red below, which both would have been terms for uh, different purities of red iron oxide, uh, were mixed in kegs already ground in oil. So we take this to imply that these paints were very common and in high demand. And what I'm sure many of you have noticed, and what I have always found interesting, is that so many of these natural materials were still being imported. So this list, like, I mean, it even includes lamp black, which is a carbon-based black, which I'll talk about later on in the presentation that easily could have been made here, yet we're importing it. So um, even towards the end of the century, we have this written account that there were, quote, several ochres found in abundance in Virginia, Connecticut, and other parts of the United States. Um, and yet still, we know that they were being regularly imported by ship from the old world. Other primary resources tell us how these materials were used on Virginia architecture. Red and yellow iron oxide pigments, known as ochres, again, were very common in architecture, particularly exteriors, um, as they were extremely color stable and they weathered well. They were also relatively cheaper than other pigments, which was, of course, an advantage. When you're painting a house, it requires a great deal of paint. That could be a costly venture if you use more expensive pigments. So this advertisement in the Virginia Gazette describes the sale of a property in King William County, including two dwelling houses and multiple outbuildings that are, quote, all painted with ochre. And in addition to documentary sources, we have visual sources like this 18th century painting by Winthrop Chandler showing a dwelling house painted with yellow ochre and having white trim. And when discussing primary counts, I just have to include the 1798 written agreement between Williamsburg resident St. George Tucker and the house painter Jeremiah Satterwhite, whom Tucker hired to paint his house that same year. So this document is a really fantastic resource for the colors, pigments, and even binding media that Tucker specifically requested for his dwelling. So for the roof, he asked for a Spanish brown paint enlivened with red lead. For the sides of the house, a pure white but he wants the doors to be a chocolate color. So chocolate color is a deep brown that was made with iron oxides, um, and that is a color that comes up again and again in historic treatises. The lower status kitchen, however, was to be painted a light yellow ochre, and the red on the roof was to be mixed with tar and fish oil. Um, so this image here is how the house appears today in our historic area. Unfortunately, there was very little exterior paint evidence to analyze, but the 1798 color scheme is executed with modern paints. So in case all of you were wondering, all of our buildings today are painted with modern paints. This is because we have over 400 buildings to care for and a really intense maintenance schedule. So we paint dozens of buildings, I mean actually more like 50 to 60 each year, and as much as we've we value the appearance of historic paints. It just would be cost and time prohibitive to use historic hand ground paints on all of our structures. And of, also, of course, historic paints are mostly lead-based, so toxicity is a, a major consideration. But we never strip old paint from our buildings. We consider the paints to be part of the historic fabric, and we always want to retain that evidence for documentation and research. So now for the rest of my presentation, I'm going to shift the focus to specific materials, starting with ochres, and we're going to look at these in more detail. I would say that red iron oxide is one of the most common pigments I find in historic house paint. 
It is, as many of you know, um, a naturally occurring red earth pigment. It gets its color from the red iron oxide mineral hematite. And the natural forms are often mixed with various minerals, like quartz and clays, and, and can vary widely in hue. So in the 18th century, there were three sources of red iron oxides. Of course, you had the natural forms, which were collected from the earth and prepared simply by washing, levigation, and drying. And I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this process. They could also be produced by calcining or heating a yellow ochre. Um, this form was also known by the term burnt ochre, um, but this is actually not the same as burnt sienna, which re refers specifically to a very special pigment made by calcining only the yellow iron earth mined in Siena, Italy. Um, according to period price lists, burnt sienna was as much as 50 times more expensive than your common ochre. And lastly, red ochres could also be prepared using various chemical methods like calcining iron sulfate or oxidizing an iron rich metal, such as the Mars colors, which saw large scale production in the late 18th century. So unfortunately, for those of us studying historic pigments and their use, in the 18th century, the nomenclature of red iron oxides was imprecise and inconsistent, to say the least. So red iron oxides occur under various names in period accounts. We have red ochre with various spellings, Venetian red, Turkey red, Indian red, Spanish brown, and burnt ochre, just to name a few. I would, see the term, I would say that the terms that I see most regularly are Spanish brown, red ochre, and Venetian red. So here are three examples of red iron oxides listed in period advertisements. So one mentions both Spanish brown and Venetian red, so clearly there was a delineation between the two. And then this ad in the middle um, from 1792 Virginia Chronicle mentions Spanish brown, and then we see it again in this Virginia Gazette ad from 1785. And notice in this ad, they also mention yellow ochre here, um, but they specifically refer to this red iron oxide as Spanish brown um, and not red ochre. So red ochres occur widely in Great Britain, particularly from iron mines in a place called the Forest of Dean, where the red ochre was notice, noted for its intense color and fine texture. Spanish brown refers to a low quality red iron oxide pigment. As the price lists from that time, it's almost always the cheapest variety. But Spanish brown is a misnomer since the term was applied to English sourced ochres as far back as the early 17th century. So it does not appear to have been sourced from Spain. It always seems to be applied to red ochres from a natural source, um, but apparently it did not have as intense a red color as other red iron oxides. So for instance, contemporary accounts compare it to Venetian red, but say it is fouler, uh, probably a reference to its, its color and grittiness. Venetian red is another form of iron oxide red. Um, historically, it too is supposed to refer to a naturally sourced ochre with a brighter red hue. It was described as having a scarlet color in Dossi's 1764 treatise, The Handmaid to the Arts, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and a 19th century document suggests that Venetian red was sourced near Verona, but the name seems to have been applied to almost any red iron oxide. And, and this continues today. So for instance, I had in my reference collection two examples of Venetian red. And the sample on the left appears to be the natural variety because we see these small red grains of hematite coating larger particles of, of silicate grains as well as other associated colorless minerals. Meanwhile, on the right, um, this sample appears to be, I believe it is a synthetic hematite. All of the deep red particles are all very, very fine. They have a very similar size and shape, and it's very pure. We don't see any of those associated colorless minerals we saw in the sample on the left. Yet, 
both are marketed as Venetian red. So these are modern pigment samples, but the same thing was happening in the 18th century. The term we see used most often in period accounts and house painting treatises is Spanish brown um, because it was very cheap and it, it was known to be, have a very durable color. Um, so it was described by contemporaries such as John Smith, quoted here as being a, quote, dark, dull red, a horse flesh color. And he goes on to say, tis of great use among painters, being generally used as a priming color, being cheap and plentiful. So indeed, I, I actually almost all, always find Spanish brown primers in my architectural paint analysis. Um, and even on painted furniture and wooden objects, I will find it used as a primer. And this always surprises people because today when we use primers, they're white. But this wasn't traditionally the case. So here's an example of, of a red iron oxide primer. Um, this was uh, taken from some interior woodwork at one of our buildings called the Finney House, which we believe dates to the late 18th century. And when I conducted the paint analysis, I found that a red iron oxide primer was used throughout. So we can see it here in this paint cross section. Here is the wood substrate. Here are all of the paint layers applied over time, and I'm actually not showing the entire sample. These are just the earliest layers. But there is a very thin red iron oxide primer applied to that wood. So you can see how thin the primer was compared to the other paints. And I, I found this very similar early stratigraphy everywhere throughout the entire house. Um, now in this center image, the primer is a bit thicker and we can see these chunky, rich, deep red iron oxide particles. Um, but the matrix is actually kind of pink um, because there was actually a lot of lead white mixed in with this pigment. And I thought that I would just also point out while we're looking at the center image um, that the paint that was applied on top of the red brown primer was a buff or like a tan color paint. And it was made by adding yellow iron oxide to a lead white. So you can see this really beautiful bright yellow um, iron ox yellow iron oxide particle um, in that lead white matrix. And then later on, we have another paint. This was actually a deep chocolate brown color, although it appears red in the cross section. This also was made with iron oxide pigments. And, and here you can see this really great large particle of silicate surrounded by finer bright red grains of hematite. And on the right, you can see a dispersion of um, the red iron oxide particles collected from the primer for polarizing light microscopy. And it was also mixed with a lot of lead white and um, other pigments. So John Smith, in, a, in addition to suggesting people could use Spanish brown as a primer, also said that it was great as a finish coat. And we actually find Spanish brown as a finish coat throughout the historic area. Um, and a lot of our visitors really have strong reactions to this color because it doesn't align with their perception of 18th century buildings being all white houses with green shutters. But research is the backbone of everything we do and we rely on the evidence. So here um, you can see a cross section of paint that was um, taken from the exterior of this house in the inset here, the Peyton Randolph house. And so what we're seeing is the wood substrate and the first, that, that Spanish brown paint. Um, so the surface of this paint, this is dirt and mold and cracking. This suggests that the paint was exposed for a very long period of time. It's not a primer. Um, so, uh, and then a little bit later, this white paint was applied. So this, this, um, Samples from this building have been analyzed by, I think, as many as four architectural paint analysts, including me, and we've all come to the same conclusion. Um, so this, we do find this red-brown paint used very often on our building exteriors. And we've replicated that sometimes in other buildings where we don't necessarily have that evidence, but we think that um, in the context, red-brown would have been used. 
I personally love it. I love the way the red iron oxide looks um, on the exterior of the buildings. So some of the other ways that I um, confirm red iron oxides is through um, this really neat technique called SEM EDS mapping. So in the image on the left here, you see a cross section from the Robert Carter house. Um, this house was dated dendrochronologically, um, that means tree ring dating, to uh, 1723. So we believe that this very, very uh, first red-brown layer dates to that time. And um, it was such a bright, intense red that we got really excited because we thought it might be vermilion, which is a mercuric sulfide, which would have been much more expensive than red iron oxide and would have just told us a lot more about the person living in the house at the time. Um, so I analyzed it with, with multiple techniques, including SEM EDS mapping, where I can actually ask the software to um, make it red where it sees iron and make it light blue where it sees lead, et cetera. And so what you're seeing here on the right is a false color SE, SEM EDS map of this area. And what we see is that that certainly that early red brown paint is rich in iron and also has large silicon particles associated with it. So this is definitely a, a red iron oxide. We did not detect any vermilion, which contains mercury and, and sulfur. Um, so just a, a very, very pure, very bright red um, form of iron oxide. So let's talk a little bit about yellow iron oxides, yellow ochres. So these, like red iron oxides, went by various names in the 18th century. So we have yellow ochre with the various spellings, spruce ochre, stone ochre, clay ochre, and more. John Smith talks about both plain ochre and spruce ochre. He says that yellow ochre is found among stiff clays particularly near Oxford, and that when dug out, it, quote, tis a color that with pains will grind very fine. It bears an excellent body and resists the weather well. So yellow ochre gets its color from the iron oxide mineral gertite. And like red iron oxides, if it is sourced naturally, it's going to contain these associated minerals like quartz, calcite, clays, and more. And it can also contain red iron oxides because these occur naturally together. And yellow ochre is also a component of other colored earths like siennas and umbers, which were certainly used in 18th century house paints, but I'm not going to discuss them in much detail today. So here um, are some examples of yellow ochre found in our building, some of my most memorable examples. So here we have another sample from the Robert Carter house, um, which um, had a few yellow ochre pigments. Um, it had this early, very, very deep, um, intense yellow paint, which um, contained yellow ochre, as well as white lead and even some red lead, which has a bright reddish orange color, which really um, would have intensified this yellow. Um, and then later on, we see more large coarse particles of yellow ochre used to make this olive green paint. So here it was mixed with a blue pigment called Prussian blue. Um, so analysis of these bright yellow particles detected mostly iron and oxygen. And then in these images on the right, we see a dispersion from that deep yellow paint. Um, and we have a mixture of lead white and yellow ochre. And like I said, I also found some red lead as well, but you don't uh, necessarily see that in these images. But I just really, really love these really, really enormous yellow iron oxide particles in this cross section. I, I, I took dozens and dozens of cross sections from this area in the house. It was from the stair passage and they all had these really, really wonderful coarse bright yellow um, iron oxide pigments. <laughs> 
So um, I, I actually don't usually see those deep yellow paints used that regularly throughout Williamsburg. I usually, however, find yellow ochres mixed with lead white to create tan colors, which in historic treatises were often referred to as buff colors. So on the left side of the screen, we're seeing a sample from a building known as the Koger Shop. This particular sample was taken from an interior door. And these early buff paints you see here, they're um, mixtures of lead white with, you can see some coarse particles of yellow ochre there. And on the right, we have a sample from the Getty House, which dates to about 1762. This was taken from the first floor dining room woodwork. And um, we have a white primer, no, not a red brown primer, um, which is followed by a, a lighter yellow finish. It looks so light in this sample, but it, in reality, it was, a, it was a much more like medium dark yellow shade. So again, both of these were pigmented with yellow iron oxides. Carbon-based blacks. These are natural blacks that played a major role in historic paints. There are various forms, but all were based on burning carbon-based material. So lamp black, which was also known as soot black, was a very, very fine black pigment made by essentially collecting soot from a flame. So when you think about how fine, you know, the black in soot is, and this type of black shows up most often in 18th century documentary sources. One could also burn wood or plant materials to yield a black that went by many names. Here, um, these excerpts are from Dossie's Handmade to the Arts. He calls it blue black and says it is the coal of wood or other vegetable matter and that vines were the preferred source. So I'm sure that a lot of you have seen vine blacks um, available at, at pigment sources. It isn't really possible to tell what the source is with blacks, so I typically will just refer to them as carbon-based blacks. Bone, horn, and ivory were also burned to produce ivory or bone black, sometimes even referred to as horn black. So these I have come across in some objects. I have not identified them in architectural paints as they would have been the more expensive blacks, but I don't think that that means that they weren't used. So here we have a really excellent example of carbon-based blacks used in house paint. So this is a, um, a sample taken from the interior of the Robert Nicholson house, which dates to the mid-18th century. Um, one of the first layers is actually, again, not a red-brown, but a thin gray primer, followed by a dark brown paint. And um, there were multiple layers of dark brown paint used inside the house in this period. And we have these like enormous opaque black pigment particles in the cross section. Um, and then here in the dispersion, we can see them even more closely. Um, some measured as much as 30 microns across, so extremely coarse. Um, this brown paint also contained red and yellow iron oxides, as well as red lead pigment. So I, I did analyze these black particles. I was quite sure through microscopy that they were carbon-based blacks, um, but I, I wanted to be certain because they were some of like the largest carbon-based blacks I'd ever seen. So I wanted to make sure they were not manganese oxides, which are black minerals that are associated with um, umbers and siennas. But no, uh, SEM EDS told us that these contained mostly carbon, there was no manganese detected, so this is certainly a carbon-based black, not a bone or an ivory black. Those would have contained calcium and phosphorus from the starting material. So its, it's large size um, also tells me that this is a, a carbon-based black made by burning wood or other vegetable matter. It's, it's clearly not a, a soot or lamp black, which would have been a much finer particle size. <clears throat> 
And I just wanted to quickly show you this paint cross section from the Thomas Everard House interior from a door architrave. And I love this cross section of the early gray paint because you can actually see this large fragment of wood with um, some of that cellular structure intact. It's much more visible in the UV light image. And this urn base was excavated from an archeological site that we are currently working on called the Custis site. Among many things, it was one of the most renowned gardens in Virginia in the 17th century. So amazingly, this ceramic fragment still retains paint. Um, that does not usually survive archeologically. So you can see it's painted red um, but underneath the red paint in areas where it was flaking, we could see that there was this earlier bluish gray paint. And when I did some analysis, this paint was found to be a mixture of lead white and black, but clearly this was a soot or a lamp black. And I'm confident of that because the particles are just so incredibly fine. They're, they're less than one micron. So these particles of lead white are, you know, maybe at the most three microns. Um, and all of these particles of lamp black are, are much finer than that. So, so the size can also help distinguish um, lamp blacks from other carbon-based blacks. Calcite and or chalk was often added to house paints as an extender. And as many of you know, it is still used today to extend paints and a lot of other materials. It, wasn't used as a pigment on its own in oil-based house paints because it is transparent in oil. The refractive index of the, the chalk is just too close to the refractive index of oil. However, it does become an opaque white paint if it is mixed with other media like animal glues, which is a type of paint known as a distemper. So distempers would have been applied to plaster walls and it dried to a very matte, soft finish. Unfortunately, we don't have any surviving plaster walls from the 18th century in Williamsburg, so we don't really have distemper here to analyze. But we do have an extensive collection of wallpaper fragments, and wallpapers are made with distemper paint, so pigments bound in glue. Um, so since 2016, I've been working to analyze fragments of wallpaper in our collection. And I find across the board that the whites are made from calcium carbonate, particularly chalk. So there are various forms of calcium carbonate, but when I say chalk, I'm referring to the naturally sourced variety. So the Southeast of England has a lot of great sources of chalk, as you see here in this image from the Isle of Wight but we do see it being imported from there regularly to the colony. And these chalks look so distinctive under the scanning electron microscope because they contain these really beautiful microfossils known as coccoliths, which have these very distinctive round radial um, plated shapes that one can see easily under the scanning electron microscope as well as with PLM. So their presence indicates chalk from a natural source. And if someone, not me, was an experienced micropaleontologist, you could identify the species and narrow down the source region. But um, unfortunately, I'm not experienced enough of a microscopist to do that. But for my work, identification of natural chalk is really um, enough for a project. So lime washes are another form of calcium carbonate that we see very often in architecture. So to make lime wash, lime can be prepared by calcining limestone or oyster shells. Um, it's simple chemistry, but it's really like magic if you see it occur. Um, I took these still images from a really excellent YouTube video about making lime from oyster shells. And here is the point where they're slaking the lime after calcining it with water to form calcium hydroxide. And it's just really, really amazing to see how they add water and these oyster shells just start bubbling and eventually turn to this white, limey slush that can be lime wash. Um, and a few months ago here at CWF, we did our first lime kiln burn um, because we make our own 
lime for mortars and lime washes from oyster shells. We've been we've been doing that um, in a different fashion, but this was the first time that we um, made this lime kiln using 18th century um, designs. We have many records that um, mention buildings being lime washed in the historic area. So for instance, we have um, this 18th century ledger that was found in the attic of one of our buildings um, from a local workman named Humphrey Harwood. And he regularly um, charges his clients for lime washing or whitewashing the buildings in Williamsburg. So lime washes were just so cheap and plentiful that we often see rooms or buildings being lime washed multiple times a year, usually about once a year. So we end up with these really thick layers of brittle lime wash on our buildings. Um, the analysis of lime washes is really complicated because the material is so thick and brittle and it tends to break apart as soon as you use, use your scalpel to collect your sample. It's so frustrating. So you need to take larger samples. This isn't always possible. Um, and I need to cast them in much bigger resin cubes. So in this image here on the bottom left, um, you can see I'm holding a typical paint sample, which is about one cubic centimeter, and a lime wash sample, which is almost four times the size. And the interpretation of samples is hard too. So um, in these images on the right side of the screen, these are cross sections taken from lime washes in the Brafferton building on the campus of William and Mary, which is also located in, in Williamsburg. It's kind of one of our sister institutions. Um, and there were so many layers of lime wash applied to the inside of this building, and they had no dirt separating them um, to amplify those interlayer boundaries. Just so, so many layers of lime wash. Um, so I really had to rely on ultraviolet light to really um, bring attention to the, the boundaries between those layers and to be able to count all of the lime wash layers. So analysis of lime washes is, is very challenging. I've done a lot of work with buildings in Bermuda because that island has a rich history of 18th and, and even earlier buildings. They use lime wash in a totally different way. That's very striking. So lime wash is applied from the top to the bottom, from the roof to the ground. But these lime washes were often pigmented, almost always with earth pigments. So these would have been able to withstand the very alkaline environments of the lime washes. And this is one example taken from the interior of a dwelling called Seven Wells. This sample was taken from the inside of the parlor fireplace. And we found many, many layers of deeply pigmented brown, yellow, red, orange, and pink lime washes. Now, the sample was so thick, it fragmented into multiple pieces. So I had to cast each one individually and number the sequence of layers that way. And the sample continues. So we have these like, you know, deep reds, oranges, bright yellows, pinks, peaches. These are all made by combining iron earth pigments with lime wash. Now I know tar isn't a pigment, but it is a naturally sourced material that was often used alone or mixed with iron oxide pigments as a paint. Tar was probably the earliest paint medium used by the colonists since it could be readily obtained from the pine trees all around them. We have a description of its production from 1664, um, and the writer says that it was made using the American pitch pine, using knots of timber that were fired in a clay furnace with a sloping floor, and the tar ran out the bottom. And another account um, from 1704 notes that every year about 3,000 barrels of tar were made in Princess Anne County in Virginia alone and used locally on houses and boats with the rest exported. References to tar on buildings are numerous in period documents, including things like roof shingles. So we actually have many 
dark red roof shingles in our collection and I've analyzed them and these were usually painted with a mixture of tar and red iron oxide. Just over 10 years ago, we reconstructed the site of an 18th century armory and tinsmith shop. And these utilitarian buildings were coated with pigmented tar. The recipe that we used was a three to two to one ratio of Stockholm tar, linseed oil, and red ochre pigment. And the tar was warm when it was applied, and I can see why it was used as a preservative, because it really soaked into the pores of the wood, particularly because these weatherboards were riven, not planed, so they were rough, and they took up the tar more readily. And I know this because I helped do this, um, because I was really excited about this tar paint, and so I went and I just did a little a bit of painting with the painters. Um, I wanted to know how, you know, what its working properties were, how it felt to apply, how easy it was to apply. So this was just like really exciting for me to be a part of. In cross-section, tar is very ephemeral, especially when it wasn't pigmented. So here are two examples where we found unpigmented tar on our buildings. These were in areas that had been protected by later additions, so for many years they were hidden and preserved. Now both of the surfaces were so dirty that it was difficult to see any coating, but when I brought the samples back to my lab and looked at them with low power microscopy, um, I could definitely see these fragments of a reddish brown resinous material. And I put a few um, bits on a glass slide, slowly heated it, and I knew it was tar right away because you had that immediate uh, odor of tar, very distinctive. Um, I also identified it with FTIR. But now in the cross section, it would have been so easy to miss if you didn't know it was there. So these images, um, top and bottom, I'm showing in ultraviolet light because in the visible light image, you really can't see anything at all. Um, but so we have the wood here and here and here is the pine tar um, and a lot of that embedded dirt on the surface. Um, so very, very difficult to distinguish. And this has taught me to always look out for tar on buildings because it could be very easily missed. And that brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Um, I could talk all day about natural materials in um, just house paints alone. Um, and, but you know, in the interest of time, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you again for this opportunity to share my research with you. Um, my email address is here. If you ever feel the need to reach out to me, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you.